Good afternoon, everyone. I didn't realize I was sharing my experience on psychedelics, but in a sense, <laughs> perhaps I am. Um, so I'll be talking about compounds like psilocybin, magic mushrooms, DMT, ayahuasca, mescaline. So these are compounds that have been used for thousands of years by our species, and I'll try and tell you what they are and how they work. Um, it all begins pharmacologically. Uh, these are drugs, they're molecules, they look a lot like serotonin, you've probably heard of that, an important brain chemical for modulating conscious states. Psychedelics are kind of like serotonin imposters. Because they look like it, they can come in and hijack that system. These heat maps you're looking at are where the trigger site of psychedelics are most expressed in the brain. We've heard a lot about narrative today, in a sense, these are regions of our brains that are disproportionately expanded in our species. And in a sense, it's like the narrative or idea system that is most hit by these compounds. We're going to come back to that, the theme of belief. Etymology, uh, where does the term itself come from? Well, it comes from this chap, 1956, Humphrey Osman, psychiatrist. And he conjoined two ancient Greek words, psyche, which most literally actually means soul, uh, and the other component, delic, means to reveal or to make manifest. So soul revealing, hinting at insight, psychological insight being core to how these compounds work. This is a summary slide of the latest clinical evidence for psychedelics. There's a lot on here because there's a lot right now. A lot's happened in the last couple of decades or so. So I'll emphasize a few take-home messages. The first one is as the name suggests, psychedelic therapy. This isn't about just a drug. It's more about how the drug is given, the context in which it's given. So there's psychological support for these dosing sessions. There's preparation ahead of time, integration afterwards, and there's music listening and a curation of a kind of ceremonial-like context when uh, these medicines or drugs are given. The other take-home message is that the Improvements that we see, whether it's depression um, or, say, addictions, it's very rapid. Uh, we see it very early on. Here at one week, you can see everyone improving. Those lines are individual patients from a depression trial we did publish in 2016. And the other point is that the action is fast, but also enduring with very few dosing sessions. And it's kind of a paradigm shift for uh, mental health care that Ordinarily, when drugs are given, they're given every day. It's like a, a chronic dosing regimen, pop a pill every day. This is very different. It's one or two isolated experiences, in a sense, that are curated in a particular way. Another take-home message, there's a lot of different psychiatric disorders now where we're seeing promise. It's not just depression. Yes, there we are seeing promise. 70% response rates across trials are quite a bit better than what we're used to, whether that's conventional medication for depression or psychotherapy. They tend to hover around 50% response rates. Even placebo achieves 40%. Um, so to be seeing uh, these improvements is telling, but also to be seeing them across different diagnostic categories. There's something important about that. We're going to come back to it, and actually it relates to belief. So here's a trial that we did a few years ago. It was a head-to-head. -head between psilocybin therapy for depression and a conventional antidepressant drug, Lexapro. The short story is, here is that virtually every outcome measure favored the psilocybin therapy, whether it was the core depressive symptoms, anxiety, anhedonia, that's experiencing pleasure, or general functioning, work and social functioning. Psilocybin therapy appeared superior. So there's huge promise here. Uh, in terms of the action, how does this work? A lot of the core aspects of how this working, in a sense, are psychological. The biological is just as important, and we're going to go there. But there are certain relational aspects. Trust seems to be a very strong predictor of therapeutic improvement. So trust with the people looking after you during these dosing sessions. And then emotional release, feeling strong emotion. And this is a, it's a visceral insight in a sense. It is psychological insight. It's tied up with the emotional catharsis, the release, but it's a very human kind of insight. It's not an intellectual insight. It's not a heady thing. It's a body thing. It's a feeling thing. And that often looks like people crying. It's tears of 
strong emotional release. So that's another strong predictor. Now, people rightly have questioned uh, whether this is all some kind of placebo response. As I said, placebo accounts for as, as much as 40% of response in uh, depression trials, so a lot. And we need to be doing better and more than just some kind of positive expectancy or placebo-like response. So is that applying to psilocybin therapy? The best way to address that is to measure it, and we did that in that head-to-head -head trial with uh, Lexapro. What we found was quite surprising that actually pre-trial expectations for Lexapro predicted the magnitude of response to Lexapro. That's what we're used to. That's the placebo response. That's positive expectation. But with psilocybin therapy, we didn't find that relationship across any of the measures. In fact, what we found was numerically or directionally the opposite. People who had the lowest expectations did better, and those who had inflated expectations didn't do quite so well. So it's superseded expectation. This is more than snake oil. There's something substantive to how this is working. So what is it? Well, a lot of my work has been brain imaging, looking in the brain, looking at brain function while we give these compounds. And out of that, I was asked over 10 years ago now, how could psychedelic therapy be useful for addiction? And there I gave a metaphor of shaking a snow globe. It was partly inspired out of the brain imaging work we were doing, but also, in a sense, sort of intuition about the psychology of things. We've heard today also about chaos as well as belief. We've heard about fruitful chaos. I love that term. In a sense, I think this is what's happening here with psychedelics. There's more going on. We measure it with a measure uh, called entropy. I call it the entropic brain. There's more information, in a sense, more bits of information that we see across time in the brain. The brain becomes faster in its activity, more bits there, but also finer, finer grained, less coarse grained under the drug. So it's both a metaphor, but also very much resonant with what we see in the brain when we do functional brain imaging with these compounds. And that entropic brain effect relates to insight. The bigger it is, the bigger the scores of psychological insight. And then through that, that's predicting people doing better downstream. So that's our model. That's our model in a sense of the acute action of the drug shaking the snow globe. But after a big snowstorm, you have a surface that's more open, that's freer, more flexible. And that's a metaphor here for what we see after the drug session, not the acute action, the immediate action, but the enduring action. It's a space that's opened up, that's freer. People are less stuck in ruts and more able to move around. Now, I've talked about belief. And in a sense, we experience so much of the world through belief. Sure, high-level belief, say political belief or religious belief, but also at a lower level, at a perceptual level. Optical illusions like this, where you hallucinate motion that's not there, this is entirely static, is a reminder that we experience world through belief. It suggests that it implies that there's motion here, so we see it. But it's us experiencing things through our assumptions, through our beliefs. Now, Rebus is a principle that puts psychedelics into this mix. If that's how the mind and brain works ordinarily, what do psychedelics do? Well, they di dial down those beliefs, at least the weight or influence of those beliefs. And in psychopathology, this is an idea that I really want to drill home for you. Beliefs often go awry. In fact, I would say that overweighted belief and habit and bias lies at the core of psychopathology, the core of mental illness. And that's the core that psychedelic therapy, through their liberating action, can target and remediate the problem. That liberation, that freeing act, action of the psychedelics. Here's just an example of a belief that's gone awry in a psychopathology, the most deadly psychopathology alongside opiate uh, use disorder. It's anorexia, tragically killing uh, uh, young women and uh, premature death there. So what is the belief? Well, you won't be able to read it because it's quite small, but here's just an example from one of the patients in the trial. Being thin makes me more valuable. You can see at the start how 
heavily weighted how confident they are in that belief. And it carries on, it carries on. It only changes when they get the psilocybin. It goes down under the drug, and it stays down for a month afterwards. And I think this is an example of the treatment getting right to the core, not just of anorexia, but this is a transdiagnostic core. This is these aberrant beliefs or biases are the core to mental illness. It doesn't explain it all, but I believe it explains a good chunk of it. So here's our moonshot uh, to end on. It takes inspiration from uh, longevity. We look at that classic chart of uh, lifespan across the decades and, and centuries, and uh, sh things aren't really changing much until we hit an inflection point. What, what happened there? Well, there was a discovery. A few things happened, but there was a key one was a discovery of the microbial basis of infection. So through realizing the nature of the problem, we could find a solution. So income, sanitation, vaccination, and so on. We can be more targeted, realizing you know, at a mechanistic level what's really going on here. It's a moonshot, but mental illness is hard. We're not making enough of an inroad in terms of improving this. Sure, it's complex, it's multifaceted, but maybe an effective treatment could recognize that, could be holistic in its action, but it could also get to the core. And that's what I would like to submit psychedelic therapy could help with. So thank you for your attention. Hopefully, we can have some questions. If you can't solve a problem, you, know, you, can't, uh, you can't understand it. So in understanding the nature of the problem, we can come in with a more effective solution. Thank you.